Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as presented by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series of lessons is called Family Seasons. And this particular lesson, lesson number seven in that series, is entitled Keys to Family Unity. Now, that's something we all need to know more about, I presume. This is lesson number seven in that series from May 18 of 2019. And as usual, we're going to start with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we bow before you now as we open this study to learn what you have to teach us about bringing families together in closer union to prepare us for the time when we'll be a part of that larger family that you're preparing for in heaven. May it be soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 For naturally selfish human beings, it's a challenge to live together with other human beings and get along just fine. God intended for the family to be the closest union between human beings that there is. There's no other union that's closer. Uh, We live together 24-7 in relationships that proved to be a a challenge. Think of the changes that are brought about by marriage. Here are uh, two presumably different individuals, sometimes very different individuals, come together and they're supposed to just blend together nicely, not to have any problems, and everything's perfect, right? No? <laughs> okay, well, we have to try over again. Try to imagine what God intended to br- by bringing Adam and Eve together in that first marriage. Unfortunately, that marriage did not last long enough in, within the Garden of Eden for us to find out what it would have been like if they had raised children in the Garden of Eden. That was something we still uh, going to have to learn about in the future. Um, There are some major passages, let me read one of them, in the New Testament, by Paul, who, by the way, was married or not married? Originally married. Originally married. I see he's categorizing things. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay, but the times we know about him, uh, his Pharisaical family, well, I shouldn't call him Pharisaical, this family who are members of the the Pharisee group uh, apparently rejected him after he came back from that experience in Damascus and uh, out into the desert. And so for the rest of his life, he lived as a single person. We don't know what goods or bad things that brought to him, but anyway. These are his words. I'm reading now from Ephesians 2, starting with verse 13. But now, in union with Christ Jesus, you who used to be far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought us peace by making Jews and Gentiles one people, With his own body, he broke down the wall that separated them and kept them enemies. He abolished the Jewish law, and uh, I'm not really comfortable with that particular translation, um, with its commandments and rules in order to create out of the two races one new people in union with himself, in this way making peace. By his death on the cross, Christ destroyed the enmity. By means of the cross, he united both races into one body and brought them back to God. Okay, now our lesson, rightly or wrongly, says that should work fine in families as well as in Christian groups. Do you think that's true? Does the death of Christ just make us nicely just melt together? Well, if we if we identify with him, in other mm, words, okay. if we're born again, because groups are just made up of individuals who come together, so each individual... Yeah. needs to partake of that kind of experience where we identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ right. and walk in newness of life and uh, we're a new creature and uh, born again. Considering what Paul says about the former Gentiles who now become who are now Christians versus the former Jews who are now Christians, do you think it would be harder for a gen- former Gentile to get along with a former Jew in those days than it is for a man and a wife to get together in, in a family in our day? A former Jew and former Gentile don't have to live together 24-7. That is a fact. I, I'm sorry, don't get to live together 24-7. <laughs> My wife isn't here right now, so... Uh, <laughs> she didn't kick me. Good. <laughs> Wouldn't some of the effects of a, sec, uh, of, uh, of a, a marriage 
that works apply to those two groups like love, tolerance, patience, kindness. It's all in there. Of course. It's got to be. See, we're... we're and, uh, well, I mean, let's think about this. God has a plan to take us to heaven. He would like to take all of us to heaven. He would like us to live there for the rest of eternity with people from every tribe, every nation, every language, every culture, and every time period in the history of our world just getting along perfectly. No problem. Right? Oh, well, in heaven, it's going to be so. <laughs> the question is, but, how well prepared are we? Right. I mean, uh, then the question comes up, how do we define Christian? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would have a little problem with that word tolerance. We don't tolerate people. We love each other so much that we get along. And, you know, my wife might want to do something different than mine. Mm -hmm. Is that the word tolerance? I, I, just, well, I'm, I'm I think you have to have an open mind, an sure. accepting yeah, yeah. mind. You're right. right. So, others that are different. Than right, you. right. And now we're coming uh, to me. I think it's uh, to me, Christian culture permeates the hearts of people from even someone who has a PhD or an MD or whatever, and someone who is a farmer. Does not matter. Someone who is in Ken Kenya playing, singing Kumbaya, my Lord, and someone in whatever else. Yes, no. Yes. Oh, it sounds perfect. <laughs> no, but it, the, the problem no, is I, with I us. I agree with you, right? <laughs> problem is with us. Well, of course. No argument about that one. Yeah. <laughs> we, we are naturally, we are born naturally selfish. I mean, right. think of the little kids and it's me, me, me. It's human nature. Mm -hmm. And how do we get over that? How does our Christianity help us to get over that? Well, God helps us to get over it. It's not a ethical construct that we try to fit into. It's it's a relationship with God, and it's He's the source of of love, and He's the only place that we can actually get that love. So, if we're all in Christ, mm -hmm. then we're in a in a different place mentally than we would. Uh, be if we're just yeah. trying to live up to some kind of standard and I've got my idea of what the standard is and you have your idea of what the standard is. The standard is Jesus. The yeah. standard is Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. You are a missionary. Yeah. Uh, let's spend a little time on this one. I think okay. this is important. Uh, you are a missionary and so I don't think you coax people or whatever into egg. You need to use a spoon and a fork. I remember telling that <laughs> this is my spoon and this is my fork. I mean, leave me alone, kind of thing. You know, I mean, I was in Lukanga in in uh, Congo. Mm -hmm. I'm going in front. I said, "You've got to have a tie." I, what does the tie have to do with me going and speaking? I exactly. Mean, you know, uh, exactly. India, same way. Why mm -hmm. are you wearing a suit? You well, un unfortunately, closely? those are hangovers from but, yes, well, the colonial in. days. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, and I can tell you that I remember very distinctly times when I would go to the rural dispensaries in Tanzania and there would be, oh, we're having a you know, visitor here, we're having a big meal and so forth. And so you sit around a table, they make a huge pot of cornmeal, um, cook it up, and they turn the, it, let it cool a little bit so it's more or less solid. I think it's really solid. And they turn it upside down on the table and so there's this, chunk of heap of cornmeal and then there's you each get a little bowl of sauce and you grab with your hands and you dip it in your sauce and you eat it and everybody does just fine. We don't need forks and knives. Well Hey the question, don't you poke me <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so what does it mean to be a fellow citizen with God's people? A fellow citizen with God's people, what does that mean? That means we give up our Nationalities, our cultures, our sexuality. No. No. We we are accepting others. Okay. I wonder if Paul was thinking about the temple when he when he said those words. Remember that the ancient temple was divided into groups into spe special areas. There was that huge outside court where, of course, Jesus turned over the money 
t turned over the carts, the, the tables of the money changers, and drove out the cattle and the sheep and so forth. That was supposed to be a place for the Gentiles to come and worship along with the Jews and learn how the Jews worshipped. So that was the outer court. Then there were the next section was a, a section close to the temple that only women were allowed to. I mean, not, not only women, only Jews were allowed to enter in. And there's a little. You, we, they actually have uh, uh, uncovered a part of that little wall that says no, nobody but Jews allowed beyond there. Then beyond that, there was an area where only Jewish men were allowed to go. And then beyond that, an area where only Jewish priests were allowed to go. And then finally, of course, the place where only the high priest was allowed to go into the most holy place. Now, do you think Paul had anything, any, any of that in mind when he said we're all fellow citizens? What does it mean to tear down the, ba the those barriers? Well, didn't the Lord Himself tear down the uh, separation between holy and most holy place? Yeah. Well, here's here's what Paul says. Look at Galatians three twenty eight. So there is no difference. This would would that mean no barriers? No barriers. There's no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. Amen. Then he goes on speaking especially to the Jews who thought they were special because they were descendants of Abraham, he says, if you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. I mean, how can a promise be any stronger than that? You all are welcome. You are all descendants of Abraham. And I think that's talking particularly about salvation because he's continued to relate to Jews and Gentiles differently depending on their acceptance of him and he sent. Do you think he did that because he wanted to or because he felt like he had he, to? Because he had to in the, the you know, in the cultural milieu. And yeah. what was the other one? There was uh, slaves. He sent Anastasis and slaves. Yeah, he sent Anastasis back to Onesimus, yeah. Philemon and they, uh, but he tried to, you know, impress on Philemon that this was a brother, mm -hmm. but he was sending him back uh, yeah. under the idea that he he was was a slave. Yeah. And then in uh, 1 Corinthians, he talks, he differentiates between men and women in terms of head covering. So he's not just saying there is no men and women anymore as if it was all unisex, mm -hmm. but, uh, but in terms of salvation, all have access. Yeah. There's no longer any barriers. Paul says that once we're baptized, we should be like that. Uh, look at Romans 6, verses 4 to 7 as an illustration of that. By our baptism, then, we were buried with him and shared his death, in order that just as Christ was raised from death by the glorious power of the Father, so also we might live a new life. For since we have become one with him in dying as he did, in the same way we shall be one with him by being raised to life as he was. And we know that our old being has been put to death with Christ on his cross in order that the power of the sinful self might be destroyed. That's that me, me, me thing. So that we should no longer be the slaves of sin. And so he gets the old those ideas in there, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in the next verse you have there, in fact, going back to the one behind it in 16, therefore from now on we, know, we recognize no one according to the flesh. We don't pay attention to wh what we are in the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet we now uh, know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away, behold, new things have come. So, how is that going to be resolved when we get to heaven? <coughs> well, you think all Christians who are here in the final stages of this earth's history will already be like that or is there going to be some magic that happens between here and heaven? I think they are going to be already like that. And they themselves will not look at themselves as, hey, I'm the perfect God. Mm -hmm. But when I look at Gordon, I say, man, he walks. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just speaking of Gordon, but yeah, isn't that true though? I yeah. mean, in a serious note, I mean, but here St. Paul says, I am the chief among all sinners, and we call him Saint, Saint Paul. Paul. See, yep. so we look he at called the Corinthian saints, didn't he? I guess. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did. He calls them the saints. He did. But I believe that 
Well, you know, there's a lot of our Christian friends who believe that we're going to be sinners here, and fortunately God is going to forgive all our sins, and somehow, boy, when we get there to heaven, just in that, either the instant we leave this earth or somewhere in the passageway, we're just going to be perfect people, and we're going to get along just fine. Is that the way it's going to work? I think there's going to be a lot of growing that's going to occur. Yes. I think you have. For more than a few seconds. It's going to be for maybe years or decades. Okay, here's a question for you. What language are we going to speak? I think that's that's a good question. I was going to ask you that. (laughs) He was on the edge of it there. Unless it's instantaneous, it's going to take some time. There's so many languages to adjust to. And when you think about it, we really don't know how many people are going to be there. Yeah. And we were promised a home to go to. It's got to be a very sizable place. Mm-hmm. But he could, un, you know, just the same way that he scrambled the languages. At, at, could be. Could that be. That he will like, unscramble those. I've pondered and it And with many tongues, times. there's an interpretation, you know, you just know uh, stuff. Yeah. But I was going to say, uh, I think you have the text later on in Galatians uh, where it says that, uh, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap, uh, whether to the flesh corruption or to the spirit eternal life. So Paul is not letting people off the hook. Mm. There, there's What we do makes a difference in terms of our relationship to God. How do you think you're going to relate to Adam and Eve? Look up to them. Yeah. More than one way. <laughs> I, I plan to grow an inch every however long. I don't know. Yeah, we're supposed to grow up. Go to be an inch a week yeah. or an inch a month or you know. inch a minute. And Ellen White says that Jesus will be even a bit taller than Adam. She says Adam will be a little bit shorter than he. So uh, we're going to be looking up. Hi there. <laughs> okay. But uh, we shall be like him, right? Yeah. We will be changed. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. Okay, so now my question that I'm going to come back to, how are we going to manage this getting together? I mean, we have trouble with a husband or, a, or our wife. Jackie. When you're a husband or a wife, it's only the Holy Spirit that can change my heart now. Mm-hmm. Well, in heaven, I won't have the sinful nature. Mm-hmm. I will have a heavenly nature. And the character that I develop here on this earth through the Holy Spirit will be what I get to take with me. Yep. So I don't see a problem. Okay. Charles, I think you have something about that. Picture a l- large circle from the edge of which are many lines all running to the center. The nearer these lines approach the center, the nearer they are to one another. The closer we come to Christ, the nearer we shall be to one another. Thus, it is in the Christian life. The closer we come to Christ, the nearer we shall be to one another. God is glorified as His people unite in harmonious actions. Ellen G. White Letter 49, 1904. Adventist Home, 179, second and third paragraph. So, I'm going to ask you out there, because we don't have a chance to actually get your answers, but I'm going to have you think about it. How has your Christianity and your membership in your local Adventist church impacted your family? Some of you probably live with husbands or wives that are not Seventh-day Adventists. Well, Jesus had some things to say about all that. And in his prayer just before he was arrested and ultimately crucified, Jesus prayed for himself first, for his initial disciples, those are the twelve that we know about, and then for all of us, I guess I, probably it was eleven at that point in time, and then for all of us. Think especially about these verses, John seventeen twenty two and 23. I think that's yours, Gary. Yes. I gave them the same glory you gave me, so that they may be one, just as you and I are one. I and them, and you and me, so that they may be completely one, in order that the world may know that you sent me, and that you love them as you love me. That's from the Good News Translation, put out by the American Bible Society. 
Does that seem a little bit impossible or maybe at least a very high standard to you? Mm-hmm. If we're going to be have the same kind of relationship with each other and the same kind of relationship with Christ as He has with the Father? How would you describe the oneness of the Father and the Son? They support one another. They lift each other up. The Father says, This is my beloved Son. Hear ye Him. The Son says, I don't do anything unless I hear the Father, uh, what, see what the Father is doing. Mm-hmm. And he tells us about the Spirit and says the Spirit won't talk about himself, but he'll talk about me. And then, yeah. and then, um, so you have this, this inner, everyone points to one another. There's no unilateral actions. They consult on everything and, uh, okay. there's, there's that oneness. So when we humans point to another, it's usually to point the blame. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So that the Godhead is pointing to each other, giving them the credit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay, Margaret, I think you have something on that. Keep yourselves where the three great powers of heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, can be your efficiency. These powers work with the one who gives himself unreservedly to God. The strength of heaven is at the command of God's believing ones. The man who makes God his trust is barricaded by an impregnable wall. This is Ellen G. White, The Southern Watchman, February 23, 1904. Okay, Tim? And we have some wisdom from about 130 years ago. It came out in 1890 in the Review and Herald by Ellen. Lengthy quote here. We do not go deep enough in our search for truth. Every soul who believes present truth will be brought where he will be required to give a reason for the hope that is in him. The people of God will be called upon to stand before kings, princes, rulers, and great men of the earth, and they must know that they do know what is truth. They must be converted men and women. God can teach you more in one moment by His Holy Spirit than you could learn from the great men of the earth. Wow. The universe is looking upon the controversy that is going on upon the earth. At an infinite cost, God has provided for every man an opportunity to know which will make him wise unto salvation. How eagerly do angels look to see who will avail himself of this opportunity. Boy, that's interesting, isn't Mm -hmm. it? The angels look to see whether you're aware, even... Well, Jesus himself said there's joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. When a message is presented to God's people, they should not rise up in opposition to it. They should go to the Bible, comparing it with the law and the testimony. And if it does not bear this test, it is not true. God <clears throat> wants our minds to expand. That's an amazing thought, too. Mm-hmm. He's interested in our minds. He desires to put His grace upon us. We may have a feast of good things every day. For God can open the whole treasure of heaven to us. We are to be one with Christ as He is one with the Father. And the Father will love us as He loves His Son. We may have the same help that Christ had. We may have strength for every emergency. For God will be our front guard and our rearward. He will shut us in on every side. And when we are brought before rulers... Before the authorities of the earth, we need not meditate beforehand of what we shall say. God will teach us in the day of our need. Now may God help us to come to the feet of Jesus and learn of him before we seek to become teachers of others. Uh. Yeah, try to think about that. You know, we can be called, and imagine you're called before a TV or something and you're being accused of being a Keep a Sabbath keeper when it's against the law. And you. We, we need to remember, God said at that point, who's going to do the talking? No. He's going to speak through us. That's an incredible promise. Therefore, we can kind of lay back. No, 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 no. Yeah. Well, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> the way God works is by stimulating the place in our brains where that memory is recorded. We... Everything that you have seen, heard, smelled, tasted, felt 
is recorded in that brain. And it's yes. bringing it back to your memory. Right. And God will help us make the right connections so that we put the right thoughts together to be logical. Mm-hmm. But what if you ignore the, the promptings, ignore the opportunity to be educated? That's a and then give your heart to the Lord just it's before not, it happens. It doesn't work. God didn't, didn't intend for us to do that. Well, let's talk about one of the challenges. Do we clearly understand what it means to have agape love? Agape love describes love which reaches out to others for their benefit and not for ours. That is the very nature of God's love. We know, of course, the, the famous verse in 1 John 4, 8, and God showed his love, I'm sorry, whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. More than that, it describes Jesus' followers so distinctly that they stand out from all others. And Dennis, I think you've got some words on that. Yes, this is John thirteen thirty four to 35. And now I give you a new commandment, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. Good News Bible. So now all the people in San Bernardino and all the people in Riverside look at Lomelin and they say, those are the people who love one another. Hmm. That would be nice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, that's not, that's not the right answer. It's supposed to be true. <laughs> it's supposed to be true, but I don't the know that it is because we aren't in the kingdom yet. We're not... We haven't well, the good thing is they won't see everybody. So, uh, to whatever extent they come in contact with Loma Linda people, perhaps well, I they will can tell experience you that. They can experience that to some degree. I will tell you this, that I deal with people every day who are sick in, ver- in various degrees, some not so sick and some very sick. And if you ask them what hospital you want to go to, I want to go to Loma Linda. Mm-hmm. There's only one person that's told me they didn't want to come to Loma Linda, and that's because that particular person has a big debt to Loma Linda, which they don't want to pay. <laughs> uh, here or and around the world, the worst thing a child of God can do is to badmouth one mm-hmm. of the brothers or sisters to folk who do not belong to church. That's the worst thing. Worst thing. Yeah. Unfortunately, it does happen all over. And it's very sad. But, but even if the people in San Bernardino and Riverside don't recognize that all the loving people live in Loma Linda, surely all the members of our church all love each other, right? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> what is this wishing business? Come on, we're supposed. This is supposed to be reality. But we're not there yet. That's why he says that. <laughs> that yeah, is, that's why he says that. It that. is reality. Yeah. Okay. The, the ideal and reality sometimes are a bit apart. Well, our humanists, I think, wants other people to be speaking well of us Mm -hmm. because we're doing what we ought. But when you actually love other people, that's the last thing on your mind because you were going about trying to do them good. And you're not thinking really about uh, those things. Mm -hmm. Disinterested benevolence. I think Ellen White uses that term. Yeah. Okay, Jackie, I think you've got some words on that. All right, 1 John 4, 8. Whoever does not love God... Wait a minute. Start over. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. Good news, Bible. Romans 5, 5. This hope does not disappoint us, for God has poured out his love into our hearts by means of the Holy Spirit, who is God's gift to us. Good news, Bible. Romans 8, 9, and 11. But you do not live as your human nature tells you to. Instead, you live as the Spirit tells you to. If, in fact, God's Spirit lives in you. Whoever does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. If the Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from death, lives in you, then he who raised Christ from death will also give life to your mortal bodies by the presence of his Spirit in you. Okay. That's a wonderful but, promise. Yeah, mm-hmm. Yes. That's a Does wonderful. that put its finger on one of the problems? Are there some among us who don't have the Spirit of God living in us? 
Well, the disciple John was probably almost certainly the youngest of the twelve disciples who followed Jesus initially. There is some hint in the Gospels that James and John were actually cousins of Jesus. We don't know that for sure, but there's some hint of that. In the beginning, John was proud, power-hungry, critical and hot-tempered, Mark 3.17, Luke 9, 54 and 55, and Desire of Ages, page 295. But his time with Jesus was transformative. And I'm wondering how many of us have had that transformative experience. He became the beloved disciple and wrote more about love than anyone else. Jim? All the disciples had serious faults when Jesus called them to his service. Even John, who came... In, excuse me, who came into closest association with the meek and lowly one was not himself naturally meek and yielding. He and his brother were called the sons of thunder. While they were with Jesus, any slight show to him, excuse me, any slight shown to him aroused their indignation and combativeness. Evil temper, revenge, the spirit of criticism were all in the beloved disciple. He was proud ambitious to be the first in the kingdom of God. Day by day, in contrast with his own violent spirit, he beheld the tenderness and forbearance of Jesus and heard his, less, excuse me, heard his lessons of humility and patience. He opened his heart to the divine influence and became not only a hearer, but a doer of the Savior's words. Wow. Self was hid in Christ he learned to wear the yoke of Christ and to bear his burden. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 295. Boy, we should just all meditate on that for the rest of our time here, shouldn't we? Paul also had some very powerful things to say about love. So this is by beholding you become changed. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. But, we, it, uh, but it certainly didn't happen before the cross. I well, believe it, the, the, it wasn't complete before the cross. Well, he, you know, he was leaning on the Lord's chest. Yeah. He was saying, look, guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and remember, <laughs> remember that just on their way up to, the, the, up to Jerusalem for that last time, they called their mother and said, yeah. you know, we're, well, we're, time comes. we're cousins. Right, right. You, you can, you, we know that you're going to be king when you get to Jerusalem. You know, just, we'll just stand one one side. of us on either right, side. Right. That'll be fine. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, I mean, yes, he was good. And the Lord knew. And mm. it's okay, you can. Because I believe that the Lord saw him after the cross. But what happens to somebody if they really go through that kind of an experience? 1 Corinthians 13 is known as the, chap the love chapter. Let me read just about three or four verses out of that. Love is patient and kind. It is not jealous or conceited or proud. Love is not ill-mannered or selfish or irritable. It's not human anymore, right? Love does not keep a record of wrongs. Love is not happy with evil, but is happy with the truth. Love never gives up. Its faith, hope, and patience never fail. Love is eternal. There are inspired messages, but they are temporary. There are gifts of speaking in strange tongues, but they will cease. There is knowledge, but it will pass. Wow. That's a pretty high principle. When you think of love, we, 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 we are trying to grow toward that, but that's what God is, and we are not God. <laughs> yeah. So well... But when you think of each one of those things, it's just amazing. Yeah. You think about it, it's far beyond our comprehension. We, I often, we use love very tritely often. We often look back and we think those early Advents must have been very special people. Ellen White had some words to say about that. She recognized how difficult it was to put together a truly Christian church. At one time she was led to say, and I quote, If pride and selfishness were laid aside... Five minutes would remove most, most, most difficulties. I just <laughs> we need that in Congress, though. <laughs> yeah, yes. tell me about it, Gordon. We need, I think we need it in the <laughs> church too. Yeah. Oh, in the church uh -oh, too. Oh, did I say that? <laughs> <laughs> before before God goes into, to me, you may or may not agree, and I'd like for you to uh, correct me. To me, all the words after that word love describes love. One cannot be. Uh, loving without being patient. Mm. 
Yeah. One cannot be uh, loving without being kind. Yeah. So all of these are describing yeah. that one word, yeah. love. The totality yeah. of it. Though. Agape. Yeah. And yeah, if, you're right. comprehensible. Yeah. if you always did things in according with in accordance with love, you probably you wouldn't sin. Mm -hmm. That is true. Right. You know, you fellas, the highest love. you have the highest order by Jesus, and that is to love your, your wives. wives as Christ loves the church. All we have wow. to do is respect you guys. <laughs> you got it easy, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, Gordon. From the Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Tuesday, it says, As human beings, our natures have been corrupted by sin, and perhaps the greatest example of that corruption is the curse of selfishness. We seem to be born selfish. We, we can seem to be born selfish. <laughs> okay, okay, we are, it, it should say, huh? <laughs> We can see this reality in small children whose basic nature is want for themselves. Me, me, me. But the time, by the time we reach adulthood, this trait can manifest itself in some pretty terrible ways, especially in the home. Well, one of the most exciting things about the gospel is Jesus came to accomplish all these things that we've talked about. He, he says... Uh, we've, we've read the words. He promises <coughs> us, us this kind of lives. Could we as human beings actually learn to live without selfishness? And I'm watching the clock here. We're running out of time. But let me read just one passage. That 1 John 2, verse 6. Those who say that they remain in union with God should live just as Jesus Christ did. So, do you think we have a ways to go? Hmm. Of course, moment God. By moment. Moment, moment by moment. Moment by moment, we can we can submit to Him and seek His will. Just as that's what Jesus did, He came to do the will of the Father. Yep. And so, if we seek I, His will every day and moment by moment, we can do that. The night before Jesus chose His twelve disciples, and or I should chose should say He chose eleven, and Judas came and joined them. He spent the entire night. Luke six. Forgotten, I think it's verse 2 or something, praying to his father. And I'm sure they were going over each name. And I'm sure also that every night, if late at night or early in the morning, Jesus said, okay, Father, what are we going to do today? Mm -hmm. What would happen if we did that? Very sobering. I'm respecting my husband. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so how can we accept the, whole, the help of the Holy Spirit to overcome those sins of selfishness? What is needed to have that kind of oneness and unity in our homes and in our churches? Love. We need humility and submission, which is really another Christ manifestation of love. Mm -hmm. These things, hearts. yeah, these things are diametrically opposed to our natural tendencies, which are constantly being promoted by Satan. Think of the natural animosities that we experience in life so commonly. There's husbands versus wives. There's parents versus children. There's masters versus slaves. I mean, in our day, it would be bosses versus employees. But so, okay. Well, from our quarterly, we have this comment which is summarizes a lot of things together. The word submit, Ephesians five twenty one, means to place oneself humbly before another person on the basis of voluntary choice. This unique principle began with Christ, Matthew twenty twenty six to twenty eight, John thirteen four and five, Philippians two five to eight, and characterizes all those who are filled with His Spirit, Ephesians five eighteen. Reverence for Christ is what motivates people to submit in this way, Ephesians five twenty one. Mutuality is self giving in self giving was and still is a revolutionary Christian teaching about social relationships. It brings to life the spiritual reality that all are one in Christ. There are no exceptions. Our lesson study guide for Wednesday, May 15. Wow. Do we really have any idea of the level of submission required for the God of the universe to come down to this earth to ultimately bow down to wash 12 pairs of dirty feet? Did he think as, you know, I, I, since I deal with that kind of stuff every day, I think as he was washing those feet, thinking of the marvelous bones and tendons and ligaments he put inside there and how well they work. Wow. Do you think 
the father would do what the son did? Mm-hmm. Charles? Yes, sir. You have some words about that? Had God the Father come to our world and dwelt among us, humbling himself, veiling his glory, that humanity might look upon him, the history that we have of the life of Christ would not have been changed. In every act of Jesus, in every lesson of his instruction, we are to see and hear and recognize God in sight, in hearing, in effect. It is the voice and movements of the Father. Ellen G. White, that I may know him, page 338, paragraph 4. Are we prepared even to think about the idea that Jesus was a perfect representation of God and that everything he did was to teach us about (coughs) God, about the Father, about the Spirit, about himself. I don't know. Jesus submitted himself even to experience a death on the cross, a death of a despised common criminal. The Romans crucified people to try to make them, to make people look upon them and despise them as much as possible. I have a very quick question because to me, what I just read, um, I've never heard anyone else ever make a statement like this. Have you? Or have you anyone else? No. That had Christ, had God the Father come down to this world, <coughs> history would not be changed. It would be exactly the same. I don't... You have read many scholars, but I've never heard anyone make such a, no. such a statement. And yet it Thank must you. be true. Because of the relationship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and how they work together, God gave up His Son to that. So we know that His heart for us is the same as what we saw. Remember, remember, Jackie, and I agree with your words there. Remember that so many of our Christian friends believe that Jesus has to be pleading His blood to convince the Father just to accept us back into heaven. The, the reason why I brought this up to me is it gives us Seventh-day Adventists a beautiful picture Absolutely. of our Heavenly Father. Mm-hmm. Jesus uh, submitted himself even to, I'm sorry, we read that already, learning to exi- exhibit submission and humility in the home is a proving ground of true Christianity. So we all know exactly what that's like, right? (sighs) If we can learn to do that at home, the rest will be easier. Carrie? Yes. The most powerful sermon that can be given the unbelieving world in recommendation of our faith is a well-disciplined family. Children that are educated to habits of self-denial and self-control and are taught to be courteous, kind, and affectionate will make an impression upon minds that nothing else can. A family of children who are coarse, unruly, selfish, passionate, and disobedient showed a bad advantage and is a bad recommendation to the truth advocated by their parents. That's by Mrs. White, pamphlet 123, paragraph 45. Wow. And I think about the news that comes by on the news channels I mean, it seems like almost every few days there's some parents being arrested for some unbelievable abuse on their children. Yeah. Just unbelievable abuse on their children. Yeah. Margaret, you have something more on that. Yeah, the mission of the home extends beyond its own members. The Christian home is to be an object lesson illustrating the excellence of the true principles of life. Such an illustration will be a power for good in the world. Far more powerful than any sermon that can be preached is the influence of a true home upon human hearts and lives. As the youth go out from such a home, the lessons they have learned are imparted. Nobler principles of life are introduced into other households, and an uplifting influence works in the community. This is Ellen G. White, Ministry of Healing, 352... Point three. And speaking of husbands and wives, parents and children, masters and slaves, and of course we would say bosses and employees today, Paul always dealt with the socially weaker member first. 
Why do you think that one? Huh? Just a husband. Why do you think Jesus did that? And why did why did Paul do that? As they were usually ignored. Yeah. Usually they were da- downtrodden, and usually the, as you'll get into here in a bit, the particularly in terms of men and wives, and she says this in Patriarchs and Prophets that men have abused the superior, you know, the position of authority that God gave uh, to Adam at that point, and have made women's lot much more something that should have been a blessing has become. Uh, a hard thing for women to endure. Mm-hmm. Jim, I think several things Paul mentions in the last of chapter five, Ephesians, and first part of chapter six, all from Good News Bible. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Children, it is your Christian duty to obey your parents, for this is the right thing to do. And slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling, and do it with a sincere heart as though you were serving Christ. Wow. Dennis, are you something to add to that? Yeah, this is from the Adult uh, Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Wednesday, May 15. Those with greater social power, husbands, parents, masters, are always addressed second. Each receives a directive quite uncommon to the culture. Mm -hmm. These directives must have astonished the believers of the first century. They level the ground around the cross and open the way for true oneness to be experienced in relationships. They leveled the ground around the cross. A little wordsmithing. Charles, yeah, Charles uh, read to us earlier, there's a circle. And as we come closer and closer to Christ, what's happening? We're, closer closer to each other. Other. We're getting closer and closer to each other, aren't we? Yes. yes. Are we willing to submit ourselves to living the kind of lives suggested by Jesus, Paul, and John in this lesson? Are we willing? I mean, that's the real question. Are we willing to actually try living a truly loving life, willing to give up our selfishness, even temporarily? Permanently. You don't have to. Permanently. Permanently? (laughs) Wow! Wow! Think he of who, it. He who seeks to save his life will lose it. And he who yeah. seeks to lose his life for my sake will save it unto eternal life. Same well, word as soul. Mm-hmm. Life and soul. Suki, it's the same word. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, think of these relationships. If we had time, we would, we would dwell on them in some, some detail. The parent-child commitment. Genesis 33 and Exodus 2 are good examples. Exodus 2, of course, is the story of Moses. Sibling commitment, Genesis 37, think about the story of Joseph and his brothers. Family commitment, think about Ruth. Oh yeah, Ruth and Naomi. Mm. Wow. It's a wonderful story. Fantastic story. You know, here is someone with a heritage background that, you know, no one would want to grow up with considering where she came from and if you know a little bit about how things were done and among the Moabites and so forth. And she must have... Well, no question about it. She saw in Naomi and hopefully in her husband who passed away and her brother-in-law who passed away and her father-in-law who passed away, she must have seen something in them that was quite remarkable. So when Naomi says, no, I have to go back to Bethlehem, she says, there's nobody else around here like you, I'm sticking with you. Mm-hmm. Your people shall be my people. Mm-hmm. Your God, my God. Absolutely. And then the marital commitment. And I find it quite interesting that he's quoting here from Hosea and not from Song of Solomon. <laughs> <laughs> so what kind of a person did uh, Hosea marry? Oh, she was a harlot. Harlot. Yeah. Prostitute. Gomar. She, yeah. no, she was a prostitute. It's called and, what it is, and, a yeah. prostitute. Get out of God, my emergency room. Gomar. God apparently told Hosea to go and marry her. Yeah. And to get her back. So yeah. he knew what he was doing then. Mm-hmm. I always thought it was kind of an accident. Mm-hmm. No. And unfortunately, considering what we know about that time and everything that was going on there, she might have been the best person, or best wife, potential wife around. But he went and bought her back yes, from a marketplace. And he paid a lot yeah, of money, lot money to get her back. Prophet didn't have too much money. Yeah. 
Each time we, and let's, let's be honest now, each time we make a commitment to submit ourselves to our spouse or to the raising of a child, we are voluntarily giving up some of our independence and freedom. This requires true Christian love if it is going to be ultimately successful. You know, I just read this week something very interesting in one of the news things. I don't remember exactly where it is, but the population of the United States is now so selfish, we're not even reproducing ourselves. If we had no immigration, our, our population would be shrinking. And why is it? Well, we want to do things our way. And a lot of the better educated, wealthier families are either having no children or only one child. We can't reproduce ourselves if we're, if we're down to one child per family. Well, Dennis, I think you've got some words about that. No, it's... Oh, no, I'm sorry, it's Jim? Jim. <coughs> Is it Jackie? No, it's Jackie. Oh, Okay. The first work of Christians is to be a united to be united in the family. The more closely the members of a family are united in their work in the home, the more uplifting and helpful will be the influence that father and mother and sons and daughters will exert outside the home. And that's Adventist home. When you think about it, the children learn. Mm-hmm. They really reflect what father and mother do with each other and with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what is the secret of family unity? Jim, I think you've got something on that. The cause of division and discord in families and in the church is separation from Christ. To come near to Christ is to come near to one another. The secret of true identity in the church and in the family. true 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 unity, that's right in the church and in the family is not diplomacy, not management, not a superhuman effort to overcome difficulties, though there will be much to do, soon much of this to do, but union with Christ. So the secret is what? Union Union with with Christ. Christ. Union with Christ. Have we truly considered what it means to be submissive to our spouses? and to fellow church members as Christ was submissive to his bride. And we're supposed to be that bride. That's us. Well, we are reminded once again about John 17, God's Christ's prayer for us, but we don't have time to read it. Now we're running out of time. Do we really believe that it is possible to be so close to Jesus Christ that it is like the relationship between the Father and the Son? Would that lead the world to believe that Christianity, the religion of Jesus, is real? If that kind of love really happened, it, it would the, the world could not fail to recognize it. True unity and Christian love exhibited in a family is a beautiful thing to behold. Think of ways in which Jesus was submissive. Each day he met with his father in the early morning hours in prayer and together they worked out his plans for the coming day. John eight twenty nine. If we really understood that level of submission, how would that impact us in our big discussions about ordination, gender roles, and headship? Oh dear, did I mention that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Are those issues in the church today? <laughs> they could be. This is from, uh, quoting from the Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Basically, marriage is a unique experiment to see if two potentially radically different people can operate as one. Mike Mason presents the struggle this way. Even the closest of couples will inevitably find themselves engaged in a struggle of wills, for marriage is a wild, audacious attempt at an almost impossible degree of cooperation between two powerful centers of self-assertion. Now, does that describe anybody's marriage here? Uh, don't, don't, don't say anything. Just think about it. That's a pretty descriptive. <laughs> I think it's a bit over here. Info. It's a little overdone. There, yes. Marriage is a wild, audacious attempt <laughs> at an almost impossible. Okay, go ahead. Marriage cannot help uh, being a furnace of conflict, a crucible in which these two wills must be melted down and purified and made to conform. And all that's from the mystery of marriage. Then continuing, 
In his brilliant chapter entitled Submission, Mason puts his finger on how this can happen. It sounds a bit like the rope parable. He who is least among you, says Jesus, he is the greatest. Luke 9.48 Marriage, at its best, is a sort of contest in which in what might be called one downmanship, not one upmanship, yes, but one downmanship. Yes. A backwards tug of war between two wills, each equally determined not to win. Not sure that's the way my marriage goes. You know, maybe there's some others of us that have that kind of problem too. That is really the only attitude that works in marriage because that is the way the Lord designed it. Surely none of us who is familiar in the least bit with human history can deny that dominant individuals have abused more subordinate individuals in many ways down through the centuries. Some have even used the passage in Ephesians 5 and 6 where it tells wives to submit to their husbands, children to obey their parents, and bond servants to obey their earthly masters as weapons in their arguments to maintain their superior positions. In fact, I've heard people making those kind of claims in our church from time to time. Do all the, those who use these arguments recognize that they are promoting Satan's ideals? In this lesson, we have talked about principles and ideals which are in direct opposition to modern cultural tendencies. Modern-day idolatry is expressed through self-worship in which absolute autonomy is a prized ethic. My importance, my desires, my preferences, my ambitions, my way of folding clothes and doing, or doing dishes are all non-negotiables. As long as I'm not hurting anyone else, Anyone else, this, this ethic exclaims, I can do what I want. Teacher's Bible Study Guide, page 96. A Christian couple, as Christian couples, we are prepared to start serious, are we prepared to start serious conversations about how we can level the playing field in our marriages? How might that help us in dealing with the strange children? Remember that submission, love, and commitment need to be demonstrated, not just in night words, but in our lives. A kind and loving father. We thank you for all these beautiful expressions of how things should be. We hope that soon we'll be able to say how things are. because that, And that's the day when you will come again and take us home to live with you forever. And may it be soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.